explicitly, particularly in the area of elocution, particularly in the area of sentencing and what that represents, and particularly in the area of preparing your case. Far too many people are still not getting remedy through the courts. And this concerns me, and it concerns me that we aren't ready on this material. I know it sounds funny to switch from the subjects that we're speaking of to this, but really it is all part and parcel of awareness, consciousness, and opening ourselves up to exactly knowing exactly who and what we are and to be competent as to who and know what we are. And one of the mistakes that we've been doing when we think of a court case is that we have been potentially misusing the material, whether it be the ecclesiastical deed poll, whether it be the lifeborn record. We haven't been preparing ourselves so that we can anticipate the kinds of people we're dealing with. I, I've said this and I still maintain this. The people we're dealing with, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, police, on their own aren't necessarily bad people. The issue is the system. The issue is the virus and the illness. If someone is suffering an illness, then the illness manifests itself in that manner. So it is our job to help not just ourselves, but to help them. So let's think about some key things here. Again, as some practical help to those that are on the call that have these urgent, urgent issues to think about the following. To date, there has been no example of administrative cure to a court action. And when we've said to you about live-born records and ecclesiastical deed polls, to their system, all this material is private. And because it's private, the court will not necessarily recognize it on face value unless it is carried through with some publicly accepted form, they will reject it. This is why when we've said in the process of claims of right, of using your ecclesiastical deed poll as a perfected claim of right, that you use the birth certificate as the carrier. It is a publicly accepted form. The reverse of it becomes the window of the private communication being the ecclesiastical deed poll. So we've had this built in from the get-go, but we haven't made it clear that when we are originating documents ourselves, the same principle applies. So there's three things in the minutes that are available, in the, in the 12 minutes that are left I want to cover. I want to cover some important discussions we've had in preparing cases from the get-go. Preparing yourself so that even if you are dealing with the most belligerent of judges or magistrates, the most corrupt of prosecutors and police, that you have prepared yourself in the best possible way for the best possible outcome from the get-go in the submission of material. The second is reminding ourselves exactly what's going on in the sentencing. And the third is getting ourselves prepared and understood about exactly what elocution is, because in future calls we will be talking in more detail about the power, the incredible power of elocution. So let's talk about this administrative submission at the time of a summons. If you have received a document from their system, no document can go unrebutted. Now, a number of people have an issue with this. A number of people say they can send you documents, ignore them, send them back. My argument is every time you don't rebut a document, every time you don't uh, uh, show your non-consent, then they can use that to perfect their claim of dishonour. So when you're summoned to go to court, there is the compelling reason and compelling uh, opportunity that you prepare yourself for that court. So what do you put in and seek to put into the record before you uh, make your special uh, attendance? Well, what I would say is that if you're going to court and you're recognising that under their own rules, the magistrate and the judge is supposed to be under their oath. 
they've heard this before. Some people have raised the oath successfully and had the cases knocked off. Some people have raised the oath and found that by raising the oath, it has caused uh, the judge or the magistrate to ignore them or worse, to threaten them. So we know that the oath is crucial because if the oath is, if they're not acting under oath, then any kind of evidence that is put forward is not admissible by their own rules. So we have quotes in different jurisdictions on that. I'd suggest to you that that is whatever the extract in their own system is on their oath, that is an important piece of evidence that we want to get on the record before we appear in their court. We also know that uh, without consent, and certainly in terms of the plea, and then certainly in terms of jurisdiction, that if they don't perfect jurisdiction, they have no right to move forward. This is built into their system. It's 101. But we also know that in many cases, uh, when they make the offer, the plea, and we uh, challenge them, BNA, SA, uh, Demura, whatever we use as the mechanism to challenge their jurisdiction, that in many cases the magistrate and the judge just ignores us and runs right over. But it's in their rules. So I would suggest to you another key part that we want to get on the record prior to uh, coming to court is their own rule, whatever the extract is, in terms of jurisdiction. Now, without going overboard, uh, there are two more. We know that, uh, that we have the right to request it is on the record, another one of their rules, and that should be in there. And the last, of course, is the right to elocution, an absolute right, that if they don't give us this opportunity, they have certainly not uh, followed their own rules. So I would say the oath, I'd say jurisdiction, um, if you want to add in uh, the issue of uh, elocution, uh, if you want to run the, the issue of, uh, of uh, non-consent, these are all elements that um, are in their rules, public record is the other one, sorry, on the record, being a court of record. These are the elements that in their own law, if I was going to court, I would want to use their own forms to lodge. Now, the great thing in lodging those things, as well as my live-born record, by the way, by just lodging those things and not trying to knock a case on the head before I go to court, those things are the bedrock that are in the evidence before we move forward. Now, they have great difficulty in denying them because of their own rules, their own law. So by accepting them onto the record, it means that this case and the judge is assumed to have read the evidence and therefore is going to be in enormous trouble if from the absolute get-go onto the record we make clear the rules, the very essential rules that they are supposed to follow. That is what I would be doing. I would not be pursuing the ecclesiastical deed poll process. I would not be trying to have motions to dismiss. I would not be doing anything until I get there. And once I get there, I can then refer to those elements. So this is one suggestion I wanted to raise with you and I hope you help that, hope that helps you. We'll talk more and more about this. And again, the material on the websites needs to be improved to make this clearer. With the five minutes we've got left, I, I said that I want to talk about sentencing and I want to talk about elocution and then we'll We'll wrap up. The question of elocution is raised a number of times, and you've heard probably this word being used more and more because we've raised it now a few times. And what, what do we mean by elocution? If you think about the way that their court system works, court, courtio, being a place to create bonds, bailments, and uh, sureties, what they need at the end of the case is for you to agree to be surety to the fiction. The body must be connected to the fiction. When the body is put in prison, 
clearly the assumption is made that the body has, has agreed in some manner or form or being deemed to have agreed in some manner or form to go surety to the fiction. Now when you go to their courts, it's now been made clear and we've said this many, many times, they do not recognize the man or the woman. They do not recognize the body. What they recognize is the fiction or uh, standing of a fiction. They don't recognize as a corporate environment the body, except for one moment. Now it turns out to be a crucial moment. Remember what we've said, that all court cases are the sacrament of penance. And we go through three stages, three acts of a play, like Shakespeare. In fact, Shakespeare was the instruction for court up until the 20th century. The first act, the pro se cutis, in our own skin, on behalf of ourselves, in our skin, is the one acting as the executor on your behalf. They are the ones confessing as if they were you. I confess to these sins. The plea is a switcheroonie. The plea is when you effectively offer the role of executor to the judge and you make the judge the executor then for the second stage. And the third stage is when the judge needs to make you the executor now and accept the sentence and the performance. Now that happens after the gavel of an auction of a bid goes down. So the moments after the gavel goes down, not before the gavel goes down, is when the flesh consents to be bound to the, the sentence to the fiction. And what the judges and the magistrates try and do is keep that window as short as possible. But that window is the area of elocution. And it is the only time that we can appeal as the speaking flesh into the court to be heard. And it is a right they cannot take away. If you want to think about the ancient reference to this, it's called the final words or the, or the words of the condemned. Do you have any final words? You probably heard this said many, many times. This is elocution. And it is always on the record. Always on the record. Now, if you ask for elocution and it is denied, then that is a fatal mistake that at least will cause a retrial or, if done properly, cause uh, the matter to be dismissed. Usually, they will say that it's merely a, uh, 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 an error and they will call for a retrial. But you have the absolute right to elocution. And what is elocution? Elocution allows you to go back to all the evidence that you had submitted at the beginning of the case. It allows you to go through all the evidence presented in the case, the jurisdiction, the behavior of the judge or the magistrate, the denial of justice, and it allows you to put all of that on the record. And they cannot interrupt you, and that is your right. This is after, by the way, the auctioning of the sentence. So the reason that a judge bangs the gavel is that that is the end of the trade. That is not the end of the opportunity, that's the end of the trade. The judge bids on the bond as both the executor and the offerer. So the judge is really having an internal dialogue, but you have the ability to participate. When the judge says, I sentence you to X, Y, Z, before the gavel goes down, you have the opportunity to say, I can't do two years. I won't do two years. And if you do it at that point, uh, the, the judge knows that the offer is going to be unsound and can't complete the auction. They have to negotiate. And you have to offer some form of negotiation. Once the gavel goes down, that's not the end of it. That's merely the end of that bidding process. And then you have the right to say, uh, I now request my right of elocution. So we'll say more of this in the future. And 
we will certainly focus more and more on the material on the, on the site to make sure